Now, our first speaker will be Professor Antoine Flao, who is the director of the Global Health Institute uh, of, in Geneva. He's also the director of the Swiss School of Public Health in Zurich. And let me say that sadly, and somehow ironically, two of our six panelists today are stuck with COVID in Geneva, <coughs> that is Professor Flao and El Storele. Two out of six of us have COVID as we speak. And uh, that can be a, a strong reminder again to all of us that the epidemic is not over. So Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michel, for your kind words. And um, thank you also uh, to Thierry de Montréal for his uh, faithful invitation, uh, World Policy Conference after World Policy Conference, and particularly talking about COVID. I wish I'd be uh, in Abu Dhabi today, uh, here in Geneva, the weather is ugly, uh, windy, rainy, uh, and very cold. So I wish you the best for the conference. Yes, you asked me um, to talk about um, COVID-19, where are we today and where are we moving to? The next slide, please. What happened in one year? Last year, we talked about the situation and what did happen in one year. I would like to mention just two elements, two major events. One, if you remember, that was in December, very shortly after our World Policy Conference in Abu Dhabi last year, when China decided to shift from its zero COVID policy to a more global policy with regard with COVID, uh, more mitigation policy. I mentioned this event because it was a major and tragic event for China. When China officially reported 90,000 deaths after, in the weeks after uh, the, sh the lift of zero COVID strategy, it has been estimated that it is probably more than 1.4 million deaths which occurred. And many uh, uh, models also mention a uh, uh, death toll of 2 million deaths in China only in a few weeks after uh, the lift of the, uh, the end of the zero COVID strategy. The second uh, very major event was when the general director of WHO in Geneva declared the end of the public health emergency of international concern. He associated this declaration with a call for vigilance because new variants could emerge in the coming months and years. And you can see uh, at the bottom right panel of this slide, in the UK, there is a soup of subvariants of Omicrons which have emerged and which are co-circulating today uh, in, in the UK, but of course, in all over the world. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Michel, you mentioned uh, the tragedy of, of uh, this COVID pandemic with a cumulative death toll as reported of 7 million deaths, but which has been estimated between 18 and 33 million deaths, as you said. We have to add to that, to these figures, more than 20 million lives which were saved due to the vaccine only in the first year of its deployment. And I think we have to add, but it has not been clearly estimated up to date, is the number of lives saved thanks to the lockdown, thanks to the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Next slide, please. Where are we now? In fact, as you said, Michel, the pandemic is not over. When you see the circulation of the waves, you can see easily that in the last year, we have known a couple of waves of, of hospitalization and also of deaths due to COVID. Uh, 
Just in Canada, if you see the figures on the right, you can notice that the total number of hospitalizations in 2023 so far is bigger than the total number of hospitalization due to COVID in the first year of the pandemic in 2020. One of the reasons is that it is not a seasonal disease. It's not like flu. It's all along the year disease, which trigger some severe forms of COVID and some hospitalizations and deaths. Next slide, please. And even if we know that it is not over, because probably we want to listen only the positive and optimistic side of the end of the public health um, emergency of international concern, of the alert, of the status of emergency, we have mo mostly give up with most of the surveillance tools, a form of disarmament in the middle or maybe at the end of the war, but not when the war is finished. And we can see on the right that the, not the case fatality ratio, but the case hospitalization ratio. What does that mean? That means that the number of hospitalization in the UK divided by the number of infection has dramatically decreased over time, thanks to the vaccines, of course, and also to the repeated waves of COVID, which uh, enhance and sustain the, uh, the immunity against the disease and the severe forms of the disease. So fortunately, now we are much less prone to being hospitalized when we caught COVID. These figures has only been done because of the excellent epidemiological system in the UK. They have some random sampling of the British population in each nation of the British population, which provide very precise figures no one in the world today has succeeded to reach. This is a major lesson we should learn from the pandemic. This UK example. On the left of the panel, you have a French example, which was completely visionary regarding analysis of wastewater. Wastewater surveillance is very well correlated with the circulation of the virus, but also it allows for detecting early new variants and the circulation of new variants in a country. In Switzerland, for instance, we have detected, thanks to wastewaters, the Pirola subvariant, the new worrying subvariants which is emerging today in the world, before in the wastewaters, before it, it was seen in clinical settings. So the wastewaters is really a, a very interesting tool. And Surprisingly, France, which was visionary and ahead of time, had given, had given up. They have stopped their waste water surveillance in 2022, in spring 2022. Fortunately, now they are coming back again. Next slide, please. One of the most important lessons we have learned regarding the mode and the route of transmission is the fact that it is an airborne disease. It is due to the micro droplets which float in the air indoor when it is poorly ventilated and which contaminate us because we breathe 20 times a minute and uh, we are infected and reinfected and reinfected again in uh, a train, in a coach of a train, in a classroom, in a school, in a hospital, in a home care facility in office, in bars and restaurants. So we we'll have learned that we should wear masks, that we should keep distance, well, that we are better outdoor than indoor not to catch the disease, that we should invest in ventilation, that we should monitor a proxy of the indoor air quality, which is CO2 concentration, 
and that we can filter the air when we cannot ventilate enough. Next slide, please. Improving air quality is key. It has been well settled by a lot of evidence today. Italian, for instance, have demonstrated that just by appropriate, appropriate ventilation of classrooms in schools, you can reduce by 80% the number of contamination in children. And as Michel said, the kids were those segments of the populations which pay a lot of tributes to this pandemic. We probably could be able to eliminate most of the viral respiratory disease, not only viral. Tuberculosis is also totally airborne, an airborne disease. We could eliminate this disease to the same extent as we have succeeded to eliminate waterborne disease like cholera or dysentery um, in the 20th century, thanks to the development and thanks to water sanitation. So with air sanitation, with an indoor air quality, which is appropriate, we could probably eliminate most of the burden of these respiratory disease, COVID, but also influenza, RSV, and many others. Next slide, please. As you said, Michel, it remains a lot of unknowns in this pandemic, and you mentioned the persistent COVID symptoms. And there are more than 50 long-term effects of COVID, uh, which is so-called the long COVID today, and which is mostly unknown, poorly diagnosed, poorly recognized. Many people are suffering after their COVID, even mild COVID. And it has been estimated that 10% of the infected people will suffer from persistent effect of COVID. And we have no treatment or very few treatments. So we, know we need to invest much more in this uh, segment of the post-COVID uh, problems. Next slide. I wanted to, to mention something which is highly political, uh, which is the fact that disinformation comes from populism and anti-science movement. I apologize, I don't want to be partisan, but it is a fact today to see that those who voted for Trump in America were much less vaccinated than those who voted for Biden, and it has a dramatic impact on their mortality, and they had a lot of mortality in excess. It has been estimated that more than 200,000 people died, were killed due to disinformation, due to anti-science movement, and that is a very worrying issue. On the right side of the panel, you have the optimistic figures which show that public information campaign is a major key determinant for the success of the response to the pandemic. So going to the stage and talking with evidence, with science on the COVID pandemic is something which saves lives. Next slide. And this is my concluding remarks, just to say we are probably much better and perform much better in crisis management than in crisis prevention. We are not very good to prevent disease. We have faced a tragedy with, I don't know, 25 million deaths plus 25 saved lives due to the intervention during the crisis, but we are not able today to take the lessons, to learn the lessons we have as a legacy of this pandemic. We are not able to implement an appropriate, appropriate surveillance tool. We are not able to invest in prevention like proper indoor air quality. We are still not able to invest in research against these long COVID issues. And we are facing strong anti-science, which 
refrain some politicians to invest and to continue to invest in, for instance, mask mandates or in hospitals or in home care facility or in uh, things people do not want anymore to hear today. Thank you Thank for you. your attention. Thank you very much, Antoine. Thank you. Um...